Hey, welcome back to Wheel on the School, Chapter 2. <clears throat> chapter 2. To Wonder Why. There they were out in the schoolyard, free! Yell appeared again over the roofs of the houses at the distant tower rising beside the dike. He couldn't believe it. But the big white face of the tower clock spelled out three, a little past three. Boy, Yella said in wonderment. He let us out almost a whole hour early just because of storks. Yella was beginning to appreciate storks. What'll we, what'll we do, he said eagerly to the other boys. But Lena took charge. Since she had started it with her essay about storks, she felt responsible. It was a wonderful day. The sky was bright and blue. The dike was sunny. Let's all go and sit on the dike and wonder why, just like the teacher said. Nobody objected. They all dutifully set out for the dike, still feeling free, still feeling happy because of this hour of freedom that had so suddenly and unexpectedly come to them. Still grateful enough to the storks and Lena to be obedient to her and sit on the dike and think about storks. But Yella lagged behind and that was unusual. Big Yella was generally in the lead. Going down the village street, he stared at every house he passed as if they were something new in the new freedom. But he dutifully climbed the dike and dutifully sat down at the end of the row of boys. Lena sat at the other end. They sat. Nobody seemed to know just how to begin to wonder without the teacher there to start them off. Yella stared up at the sky. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. There were no storks. There wasn't even a gull. Yella looked at the sea stretching empty before him. There wasn't a ship in the sea. Yella looked along the quiet row. Everybody was just sitting, hugging his knees. Everybody looked quiet and awkward and uncomfortable. Suddenly, Yella had, had had enough. He looked along the row of boys at Lena. The teacher didn't say we had to sit in a row on the dike to wonder, did he? No, Lena said, but I thought, well, he's never given us a whole hour off from school before, and I thought, well, then, Yella said, it just didn't feel right to sit when you were free. But the quiet sea and the quiet sky suggested nothing to him. Then, fortunately, a slow canal boat came pushing around a fairway bend in the Fair away bend in the canal. The two men on deck lowered the sail and the mast so the boat could slide under the low bridge. The men picked up poles to push the boat along under the bridge. Yella jumped up. Now he had an idea. Hey, let's all go get our poles and go ditch jumping. All the boys, with the exception of Elka, jumped up eagerly. Here was something to do, fun in the freedom. You too, Elka, run and get your pole, Yella said, and tell Aka to get mine too. I'll wait here. Lena stared at Yella in dismay. Even Elka had to go. When it came to ditch jumping, Elka generally was left out. He was too fat and slow and clumsy. But I thought we were going to wonder why storks don't come to Shora, Lena said. Even if Elka had to go along, she was going to be left behind all alone. Lena glared down the dike after the running boys. All right for you, Elka, she yelled unhappily. She looked darkly at Yella. Boy, if the teacher finds out that you... She swallowed her words. It was a bitter, lost feeling to be left behind all alone in the surprise-free hour. Lena had a sudden thought. 
it must be that Yellow wanted them all in on the ditch jumping so that if the teacher found out, they'd all catch it together. Maybe he'd let her in on it too. Maybe that was why he had stayed here with her on the dike. Yella, Lena asked, can I go too? Why, if it wasn't for me, you'd be sitting at school right now and I could get my mother's clothes pole. It's long and smooth and... Nah, Yella said immediately. Girls are no good at jumping. It's a boy's game. I'd be just as good as Elka, better even, Lena said indignantly. Yeah, I guess so, but Elka doesn't mind getting wet. But girls worry about wet feet and their dresses flying and they squeal and scream and then they get scared and go giggly. Yella seemed to have thought a lot about it. Lena could see it was totally no use wheedling or arguing. She drew her wooden shoes primly up under her, hugged her knees, and stare, stared wretchedly out at the sea. Teacher said we were to wonder why the storks don't come. He even said if we wondered really hard, things might begin to happen. We'll wonder why we jump ditches, Yella said shortly. He was a bit uneasy, but now the boys were coming back, Aka with two vaulting poles. Yella started to leave, and we don't care if you do tell the teacher. He didn't say we were supposed to sit like dopes on the dike. So Yella did care. He was even worried she would tell. She was no tattletale. Lena did not deign to turn around to answer but she couldn't help looking down the dike when Elka came dragging his long vaulting pole. All right for you, Elka, she said stormily. That was the trouble with being the only girl you got left out of things. And if Elka didn't also get left out, there was nothing for her to do but sit by herself or play with her little sister Linda and the other little children. What was the fun of that? Well, she'd show them. She'd sit right here and think and wonder really hard. Tomorrow morning when the teacher asked, up would go her hand. But there they'd all sit stupid and with their mouths full of teeth. It did not seem much of a threat. The excited voices of the boys came drifting back to her. Lena fixed her eyes hard upon a distant hazy swirling far out above the sea, wanting it to be a stork, but knowing all the time it was just a seagull. She wouldn't play with Elka again for a week, maybe 10 days even, maybe three weeks. Even if, even if in all that time, Yella and the rest left Elka out of every one of their games, she wouldn't bother with Elka either. She just wouldn't bother. She stared hard at the gull. It was still a gull. It wasn't a stork. Suppose a whole big flock of storks came flying up out of the sea. The boys jumping ditches wouldn't even see them. But Lena had to admit to herself it wouldn't make much difference if they saw the storks or not. The storks wouldn't stay in Shora, and the boys couldn't make them stay, so what was the difference? Lena sighed. It was hard being the only girl in Shora. She took off one of her wooden shoes and sat staring moodily into it. She caught herself doing it. It was a lonely habit. She often sat staring into her shoe. It somehow made her feel better and seemed to help her to think better, but she didn't know why. She often wished she could wear her wooden shoes in the schoolroom instead of just socks. The wooden shoes had to be left out in the portal. Lena was sure it would help no end if she could pull off one of her shoes and stare and dream into it a while, especially before doing an arithmetic problem. Lena sighed. You couldn't dream with arithmetic. With arithmetic, you could only think. It made arithmetic sort of scary, hard and scary and not very exciting. Storks were exciting. Wonder why, wonder why? 
Lena said quite hard into her wooden shoe. The words came bouncing back at her out of the hard wooden shell. She whispered it into the shoe. The words came whispering back. She sat dreaming, staring into the shoe, and the seagull was swirling and sailing far out at sea. Still thinking and dreaming about storks, she got up in her nice hazy days and wandered away from the dike, one shoe in her hand. She went slowly down the street, staring intently at the roofs of all the houses as if she'd never seen them before. The village street lay quiet and empty. Lena had it to herself all the way through the village to the little school. The school had the sharpest roof of, roof of all, Lena decided. All the roofs were sharp, but the school's was the sharpest. A thin, faraway shout and a shrill laugh came through to her. She turned. In the far, flat distance, she could see the boys. Now Big Yella, it must be Yella, went sailing high over a ditch. Hard behind him, first sprinting, then sailing high on their poles, came the other three boys. And then there came one more. It must be Elka. But Elka disappeared. He must have gone into the ditch. Now there was a lot of shouting and running. Lena caught herself waiting anxiously for Elka to appear out of the ditch. Then she remembered that she wasn't going to play with Elka for three weeks. She turned her back to the distant boys. I hope he went in up to his neck, she heard herself saying half aloud. It surprised her, for now it didn't matter whether or not Elka went into the water up to his neck. It didn't matter that the boys were, were having fun. She knew why the storks didn't come to build their nests in Shora. The roofs were all too sharp. But not only did she know the reason why, she also knew what to do about it. They had to put a wagon wheel on top of one of the roofs, a wagon wheel just like her aunt in Ness had on her roof. Tomorrow morning, she would spring it on them in the, in the schoolroom. They'd be surprised. Lena started to hurry back to the village, almost as if she had to hurry to tell someone. She put her wooden shoe back on to hurry better. There wasn't anyone there, she knew. The boys were playing in the fields. The teacher had gone. She could go home and tell her mother, but she would tell her mother anyway. It just seemed to her there had to be somebody new to tell it to. She had that feeling. There wasn't anyone like that. The whole street lay empty. It made her hurrying suddenly seem senseless. Lena slowed herself by staring at a house. Once more, Lena dawdled down the street. Once more, she stood a dreamy while before each house. Her shoe came off again. She was staring up at the roof of Grandmother Sybil the Third's house when the old lady came out. It startled Lena. I know I'm a nosy old creature, Grandmother Sybil Third said, but there you stand again, staring. I've been watching you wandering from the dike to the school and back again like a little lost sheep. Lena laughed, a polite little laugh. Oh, I'm not exactly wandering. I'm wandering. Oh, said the old lady mystified. Well, I guess wandering is always better than wandering. It makes more sense. She chuckled, chuckled a nice little old lady's chuckle. They looked at each other, and Lena thought how she had never talked much to Grandmother Sybil III, except to say a polite hello as she walked by. Now she did not know just what to say to her. The old lady was still looking at her car curiously. Is that why you have your shoe in your hand? She said gently, because you were wandering so hard. In surprise, Lena glanced down at her hand holding the wooden shoe. 
She reddened a little and hastily slipped it on her foot. What must Grandmother the Sybil think? Not that she was her grandmother. She was just the grandmother of the whole village. The oldest old lady. It certainly must have looked silly, her hobbling down the street on one shoe carrying the other. No wonder Grandmother Sybil III had come out of the house. I, Lena said, trying to explain. Lena said, trying to explain. She giggled a little. Oh, isn't it silly? She fished in her mind for some sensible explanation. None would come. But Grandmother Sybil III wasn't standing there grinning in a superior adult way. She just looked, well, mystified and inquisitive. Lena decided to tell her. I guess it does look silly and odd, but it somehow helps me think better to look into my shoe. Then, when I get to thinking really hard, I forget to put it back on again, she said defensively. Why, yes, the old lady said immediately. Isn't it funny how odd little things like that help? Now, I can think much better by sort of rocking myself and sucking on a piece of candy. And I've done it ever since I was a little girl like you. She carefully settled herself on the top step of her brick stoop. She looked as if she was settling herself for a good long chat. Now, of course, I've just got to know what it was you were thinking about so hard it made you forget your shoe. She tuckled her little old, her little old chuckle again. And if you don't tell me, I won't sleep all night from trying to guess. They laughed together. Grandmother Sybil patted the stoop next to her. Why don't you come and sit down with me and tell me about it? Lena eagerly sat down, close, exactly where the old lady had patted. Old Grandmother Sybil was nice, she thought to herself. It was a nice surprise. She didn't talk to you as if you were a tiny tot, almost a baby, and miles of years away, the way grown-ups usually did. She even st understood silly girl things, like looking into a one wooden shoe. She understood it the way a girlfriend, if you had a girlfriend, would understand. A girlfriend who also had silly tricks and secretly told you about them. Aloud, Lena said, I was thinking about storks, Grandmother Sybil. Why storks don't come and build their nests in Shora? Grandmother Sybil looked thoughtful. Well, that is a thing to ponder, all right. No wonder you had your shoe off. We here in Shora always were without storks. But I figured out why, Lena told the old lady proudly. Our roofs are too sharp. Well, yes. Yes, I guess so, the old lady said carefully, sensing Lena's sharp excitement. But that could be remedied by putting a wagon wheel on the roof, couldn't it? The way they do in the other villages. Yes, I'd thought of that, Lena said promptly. My aunt in Ness has a wagon wheel on her roof and storks nest on it every year. Ah, yes, the old lady said, but doesn't your aunt's house have trees around it too? Yes, it has, Lena said, looking in surprise at the little old lady. Why, Grandmother Sybil must have been thinking about storks too. It seemed amazing, the old, old lady thinking about storks. I guess I never thought about trees, well, just because there are no trees in Shora, so I didn't think about trees. Lena's voice faded away. Here was a whole new thing to think about. Would a stork think about trees? The old lady wanted to know. It seems to me a stork would think about trees. And it seems to me that in order to figure out what a stork would want, we should try to think the way a, storm w a stork would think. Lena sat bolt upright. What a wonderful thing to say. 
Lena fumbled for her shoe while she eagerly looked at the old lady. You see, if I were a stork, even if I had my nest on a roof, I think I would still like to hide myself in a tree now and then and settle down in the shade and rest my long legs. Not be on the bare peak of a roof for everybody to see me all the time. Lena pulled her feet up under her and looked down confusedly at her wooden shoes. She really needed her wooden shoe right now. Her thoughts were racing. You see, years ago, Grandmother Sybil was explaining, oh, years and years ago, when I was the only girl in Shora, the way you are the only girl now, there were trees in Shora and there were storks. The only trees in Shora grew on my grandmother's place. My grandmother was then the only grandmother of Shora. She was Grandmother Sybil the first, just like I am now, Grandmother Sybil the third. And you would someday be Grandmother Sybil the fourth if your had, mother had named you Sybil instead of Lena. I asked her to. Oh, I had no business asking. We're not even related, but it just seems there should always be a grandmother, Sybil, and Shora, but that's beside the point. The point is, my grandmother's little house stood exactly where your school stood, stands now, but oh, so different from your little naked school. Really different. My grandmother's house was roofed with reeds and storks like reeds. And my grandmother's house was hidden in trees and storks like trees. Weeping willow trees grew around the edge of a deep moat that went all around my grandmother's house. And in the shadowy water under the hanging willows, Pickerel, sw Pickerel, swang Pickerel swam in the moat. And over the moat, there was a little footbridge leading right to my grandmother's door. And in one of the willows, there was always a stork nest, and there was another nest on the low reed roof of my grandmother's house. As a little girl, I used to stand on the footbridge and think that I could almost reach up to the low roof of the little house and touch the storks. So close they seemed. Oh, I didn't know. I never knew, Lena said breathlessly. Grandmother Sybil did not seem to hear her. Her eyes were looking far, far back. She shook her head. A storm came, she said, as storms so often come to Shora, but this was a real storm. The wind and waves roared up the dike for longer than a week. For a whole week, the water pounded and the salt spray flew. The air was full of salt. You even tasted the salt on your bread in your houses. And when it was all done, there were only three willows left at Sybil's Corner. That is what they call my grandmother's house. Because everybody gathered there of a warm summer day to sit and chat and rest from work in the only shade in Shora. To talk and to lean their tired backs against the only trees. Then even those three leftover trees sickened and died. I guess their leaves had just taken in too much salt that long week of the storm. Later, after Grandmother Sybil the first died, they came and tore down her house and chopped out the old rotted stumps of the willows and filled the moat with dirt. Then there was nothing for years and years until they built your naked little school on the same spot. But the storks never came back. Lena sat wide-eyed hugging her knees, staring straight ahead, drinking it in, dreaming it over, the things the old lady had said, dreaming the picture. It seemed like a faraway tale, and yet it had been. Grandmother Sybil III had seen it. She had thought as a little girl that she could reach up and touch the storks. It had been so real and so close, right in Shora. I never knew, I never knew, Lena whispered to herself, and even a little footbridge, she told herself and hugged her knees. 
Grandmother Sybil III roused herself. So you see, you mustn't think our sharp roofs is the whole story, must you? She said softly. We must think about other things too, like our lack of trees, our storms, our salt spray. We must think of everything. And to think it right, we must try to think the way a stork would think. Grandmother Sybil said we. Then have you been thinking about storks too? Lena asked in astonishment. Ever since I was a little girl, and ever since then I've wanted them back. They're lucky and cozy and friendly and, well, just right. It's never seemed right again, the, whole, the village without storks. But nobody ever did anything about it. Teacher says, Lena told the old lady softly that maybe if we wander and wander, then things will begin to happen. Is that what he said? Ah, oh, but that is so right, the old lady said. But now you run in the house. There's a little tin on my kitchen shelf and in it there are wine balls. You get, eat, you get, uh, you get us each a wine ball out of the tin. Then I'll sit on my stoop and you sit on yours and we'll think about storks. But we'll think better each on his own stoop because often thinking gets lost in talking. And maybe your teacher is right. Then if we begin to think and wonder, somebody will begin to make things happen. But you go find the candy tin. I can think much better sucking on a wine ball and you take one too. You watch if it doesn't work much better than looking inside an old wooden shoe. Lena had never been in Grandmother Sybil III's house before, never in the neat kitchen. There was the shelf and there was the candy tin. There were storks on the candy tin. Pictures of storks in high sweeping trees were all around the four sides of the candy tin. On the lid was the village, and on every house there was a huge ramshackle stork nest. In every nest, tall storks stood as though making happy noises with their bills up into a happy blue sky. Lena kept turning the candy tin to see the pictures again and again. Suddenly, she woke up to the fact that she was staying in Grandmother Sybil's house a long, long time. Her first time in Grandmother Sybil's house, too. What would she think? She hastily shoved the candy tin back on its shelf and hurried to the stoop. Grandmother Sybil, storks on your candy tin and on every roof a nest. Oh! Suddenly, Lena realized she'd forgotten the wine balls. She raced back. It was hard not to look at the storks, but she kept her face partly turned away and picked out two round red wine balls. Then she ran back. I forgot all about the wine balls, she apologized. Yes, I know, Grandmother Sybil said gently, for she saw that Lena, though looking straight at her while handing her her wine ball, was not seeing her at all. Lena had dreams in her eyes. Lena was seeing storks on every roof in Shora. The old lady quietly let Lena wander off the stoop into her own house. Lena had dreams in her eyes and would not hear words anyway. On her own stoop, Lena looked back for the first time. There sat Grandmother Sybil III, rocking herself a little and sucking on her wine ball. But the dream Lena was dreaming was not just about storks, not directly. Later she would think about storks, try to think the way a stork would think as Grandmother Sybil had said. But now she thought about Grandmother Sybil who had a candy tin in her house with storks on it and who had known storks and who when she was a little girl, had imagined she could reach up and almost touch the storks. But that was not the wonder either, not quite. The real wonder was that, just as the teacher had said, 
things had begun to happen. Begin to wonder why, the teacher had said, and maybe things will begin to happen. And they had, for there sat Grandmother Sybil III on the stoop of her little house, and suddenly she had become important. She wasn't just an old person anymore. Miles of years away, she was a friend, a friend like another girl who also wondered about storks. Lena looked again at the little old lady sitting there on the stoop. She marveled. She sat feeling nice and warm about a little old lady who had become a friend. It was a lovely feeling, as sweet as a wine ball, as sweet as a dream. Lena took one shoe off and peered into it. Why, storks did bring good luck. The storks had made a friend for her. Why now, when the boys left her out of their games, she could go to Grandmother Sybil, and they would sit and talk and chat. Lena looked up out of the shoe triumphantly. Why, yes! All right, see you in Chapter 3.